So, okay, we probably can start for today, but more people are joining. Uh, good morning, everybody. Today's Friday, pre-Christmas day, and we are welcome you at today's uh, machine learning meetup, and we have a special new RIPS edition. So, uh, my name is Ellie, and today I'm going to be your uh, host for this meetup. Uh, thank you to Mario for this opportunity. And uh, uh, so why today's meetup is special? Because um, it's, as I said, it's New Rips edition. So uh, as you, all of you know, probably that uh, New Rips is one of the biggest conference in machine learning. And this year, because of the coronavirus and people cannot travel there, they decided to um, uh, gather local communities together and share the knowledge uh, as in uh, research, as so in uh, industry. And here we are today, we represent Prague. So we put Prague in New Rips map and uh, I'm really proud of all of us. And uh, what is the plan for today? Uh, so first of all, we are gonna listen to uh, Nicholas Heim. He's uh, a PhD student at uh, Czech, Technical, Czech Technical University. And uh, he will present us his accepted paper to New Rips about uh, neural arithmetic. And then we have four lightning talks from um, uh, one of the top AI companies in Prague as uh, Promises AI, Resistant AI, Sysnam, and Rossum. And they will talk about how they apply research to uh, industry problems. So uh, also one thing, at the end of the uh, meetup, we are gonna have um, a networking session and we are, not go we are gonna use for this Gazer Town it's uh yeah it looks like this it looks like uh, minecraft so you can walk there and meet different people and talk it's it's supposed to uh give you experiment experience that we are all in one room and we all together so please uh, join us there last time we tried it on wednesday and it was like fun so um uh, who joined now, uh, everybody welcome. We have people in Zoom and also people who watch us in YouTube. So, and we will kick off with Nicholas. Nicholas, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll share my screen. Okay. Yeah, so I will be presenting our latest work uh, that we just published at Neurips, um, which is about neural arithmetic. And um, just from, yeah, like from the sound of it, it could sound like we just want to teach neural networks arithmetic, right? Which is a bit weird because that's really what they are made of, um, math, math. So um, yeah, I just wanted to show this nice picture of a robot learning math. This is not really what we're doing. Um, because neural arithmetic is actually about um, making neural networks extra extrapolate better and uh, building more transparent models. And I will go into depth for what both of these uh, words mean in, uh, during the talk. So I guess I don't really have to introduce people here to what neural networks are, right? They, are, they consist of layers that have uh, a weight matrix and a bias vector and some nonlinearity, and then you stack these layers. And um, the cool thing about these neural networks is that they are universal approximators. So you can see here in the plot, basically black would be the truth and, and the dashed line would be what the neural network fits in this really simple pair, like case, right? It fits it very nicely, but that holds for any function really. The problem is that they really poorly extrapolate beyond the training range. Um, and they, they are basically black boxes. So once we fitted the model, we don't really know, or it's quite hard to tell what, what it is actually doing. And I think a nice analogy is if you would just want to, uh, or if you would open someone's head and look at someone's brain and you want to tell if they're a good or a bad person, that's basically like trying to find out what a neural network is actually doing or how it's doing its job. Okay, so the first part of the talk will be about the extrapolation part and how we do that in neural arithmetic. And then the second part will be about the black boxness and how we try to fix it. Okay, so again, three simple functions. The black part is, uh, is the true task we want to learn. 
and then the dashed lines would be what the neural networks learn and inside the training range so inside the the gray bars so for the parabola from minus one to one they learn it very nicely but outside uh, the generalization is really bad and um, to show you a little preview so the the green dashed bars are now what you what we can do with neural arithmetic and you can see that even though we train only in inside the training range we can nicely extrapolate beyond except for the periodic function on the right uh, which is something we're still working on and that's that's going to be future work okay but how do we do it for parabolas and and for the absolute value here basically uh, neural arithmetic assumes that the underlying function that we are trying to learn already or the underlying task is composed of simple arithmetic operations so addition multiplication and power functions for example and then um, we construct layers that have an inductive bias towards towards these layers so basically each unit represents one or more arithmetic um, operations and if the, if the network sees something that's close to this for example addition then it will converge to do addition and you can perfectly in the in the in an ideal world, extrapolate um, the task of addi addition. So yeah, for addition, it's it's actually really simple. The only thing you need is uh, is your input vector x and uh, and the weight matrix w. And if you just uh, form a classic scalar product of those two, you basically get uh, like you get sums of the input. And if your weights are one, zero, or minus one, you can implement addition and subtraction. For multiplication, it gets a bit more tricky um, because essentially what you want to do is multiply all your inputs with a weight in the exponent. So if the weight here is one, then you implement multiplication. And if it's, for example, minus one, then you would implement uh, division. And you can already see that um, as soon as I would input, for example, negative numbers, I would get complex numbers out. And this is really, like not really what we want because we are mostly interested in, in real valued uh, tasks. Okay, so the first neural arithmetic layer that uh, tried to do this was the neural arithmetic logic unit published uh, two years ago in 2018. And they basically do exactly what I just showed you. They have uh, an addition path that does uh, simple matrix multiplication and they have a multiplication path that does uh, almost the same as I showed you in the previous slide. And uh, they circumvent this problem with, with negative inputs by just taking the absolute value. Mm. And this basically means that they cannot process negative numbers correctly, right? Because they lose the information of the sign. So that's the first uh, drawback of this, of this solution. And then what uh, this layer is, does as well, it, uh, it gates between addition and multi multiplication. And it turns out that this gating is, is problematic for, for converging properly um, for more difficult tasks. Okay, so as an example, we, have, uh, we did a small benchmark. Assume that we want to learn a function with two inputs, uh, x and y, and four outputs. And uh, the first output would be addition, the second one multiplication, then we have division and the square root. And what happens if we, um, if we train a classic dense neural network to, to learn this task on a range, on, on a training range from minus to, uh, from zero to two, and you can see that in these heat maps here, uh, low values are, are low error on a logarithmic, logarithmic scale. Um, you can see that the dense network learns the task nicely inside this training range in this in this box from zero to two, but outside it doesn't really generalize well. Um, and then if you do this with an ALU, unfortunately you see that it does not really much better. So um, it's it's really like it also learns it inside the training range, but outside it's it's pretty bad. So, uh, and this is because it, it has troubles uh, converging in these more complicated tasks. Okay, and um, yeah, so then came the next guys earlier, 
this year from two guys from Denmark that simplified the NALU and split the two paths into an addition and a multiplication path. So addition again, just matrix multiplication and um, in the multiplication path, they now have explicit multiplications instead of this exponential stuff, uh, which means they can nicely um, uh, represent also multiplications of negative numbers. Um, and it turns out that this approach works way better for the tasks that it was designed for. So again, on the same task, you can see now that the NMU basically learns additional multiplication perfectly, right? Um, unfortunately, though, because it is designed specifically for multiplication, it cannot do any division, not even within the training range. And it can also not do square root. And uh, this is now where we came in, uh, where we tried to solve the other two tasks. So basically what we did was um, taking the, again, taking the multiplication path of the NALU, which is, which is this one, um, and lifting the whole thing into complex space. Because in, if we use a complex logarithm and complex weights here, we can easily process also negative numbers because the complex logarithm is defined for negative numbers as well. Uh, and then we just take the real part of, uh, of this whole thing because we want, we are interested in real outputs. And then you split basically these two and also because we don't really want complex weights in our network, you split the complex weight into the real part and the imaginary part. And then you can do some math to get rid of the complex logarithm as well. Um, so you end up at basically the equation in the top right here. So we have a multiplication uh, equation that looks very similar as before. It has this weight and logarithm of R, which is the absolute value of our inputs. And then we have a bunch of other things that essentially make sure that the sign information is preserved. And this, I mean, this, this is not like some magic. This basically just falls out of the, of the complex arithmetic that you do. And if you're really interested, I can show you the derivation, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that it works also for negative inputs. Um, and we can also uh, learn arbitrary power functions for this. Um, problem is that uh, this naive neural power unit, as we call it, also has problems with, uh, with convergence, similar to the NALU which is why we introduced um, a gate in front of the, of the NALU, which eases convergence because it can basically just uh, learn an identity through the whole layer. And that makes it easy to just learn a one, um, and then you don't have to propagate through the whole layer, which makes convergence much, much simpler. And then um, our, our result on our benchmark task looks, looks like this. We are not as good as the NMU, um, but you can see that we are much better than, than NALU and we can actually learn all of the tasks, right? So we can also do division and we can do square root. And just as a rem reminder, again, this is a logarithmic scale. So the, the numbers here are actually quite, quite good. Okay, so this is the this is the first part how to do neural arithmetic and how to do extrapolation on arithmetic tasks um i was i was kind of planning to just let people ask questions now i don't know if that makes sense otherwise i would just skip to the next uh, transparent model part okay so i'll just i'll just go on Okay, so we want to do transparent. Um, we want to build transparent models, and our our uh, example task for that is to learn a differential equation. And just as a as a recap, for those uh, who are not that familiar with them, differential equations basically describe change in a dynamical system. So. If you have uh, a time series or a time series like here on the left, which describe actually uh, an, a classic epidemiological model, then 
this differential equation describes how from one time step to the next uh, the, the values change in this time series. Um, yeah, and the interesting part about this differential equation is that it has a product over here on the right of i and s in, in its state variables. And it also has these powers, which can be fractional, gamma and kappa. So this is a classic case of where uh, an NPU could like really nicely represent this, uh, this differential equation. But what you classically do is uh, you train a neural network right, to predict these time series, and you basically train a neural network to um, to like learn this differential equation if you only have data from the differential equation and you want to predict it. The problem is that even though you can maybe now very nicely predict the, the course of this epidemic, um, you haven't really learned anything about the differential equation itself. You don't really know what what is happening where and so on and you like what you really want as a scientist in order to be able to interpret this problem is the equation itself so what we did was uh, instead of learning a neural network to uh, represent this differential equation we just took a stack of nau and npu and uh, taught it to learn this differential equation while at the same time trying to sparsify the whole model. So just regularizing it with classic L1 norm. And then what we end up with is, um, is the model you can see here. So the first layer is, uh, is an NPU, and the second layer is an NAU, this, this addition unit by the two Danish guys. And um, what you can see is that if I input my variables S, I, and R, in the first row, the NPU forms a product of S and I. So you can read this very similar to, to just matrix multiplication, but just with multi uh, matrix, yes, multiplication, just not with additions between the variables, but multiplications. And then we end up with, yeah, basically this product down here. Uh, it also picks out I here, which is then just I. And it picks out basically the square root of R, which is not uh, ideal, but okay, this is just like a proof of concept, let's say. Um, and then on the left side, you have uh, you have the NAU, which then of these products that we have formed in the in the first column here, uh, picks out the correct or or forms the like this addition matrix that you can see in the bottom. So this would be minus beta. This is beta, right? They're almost the same values. And then we have alpha and alpha over here, minus alpha and alpha, and the same for eta. So with a really simple uh, training method, we've now essentially recovered an equation that is really close to the truth. And because, so this is just a proof of concept, I already said, uh, we are not telling you to try to identify epidemiological models just by L1 learning trajectories of, uh, of what you can download, what data you can download from the internet. This is really just a proof of concept to show that you can theoretically do equation discovery uh, with neural networks and, and have get like a, an interpretable model out in the end. Okay, so that's already it from me. Um, our future work will focus on doing this period, like also learning periodic functions. Uh, because this is really still a problem we have, uh, but we hope to solve this actually very soon. And then um, we would like to do some more serious equation discovery than just uh, discovering what the pendulum looks like, for example. Um, yeah, so, ah, yeah, and if you have any, uh, any applications that you might be interested in, we would be very interested to hear about that, actually. Yeah, so that's it. This was uh, this was joint work with Tomasz Pevni and Václav Schmidl. If you want to check out our work, here's the link and my email. Thanks a lot. Thank you a lot, uh, Nicholas. We have a couple of questions. Actually, it's a question which you kind of responded or if which you're asking us. So first one, uh, what is the examples of real world problems where we need uh, to use neural arithmetic? 
I think one of it you gave it to us that we can solve differential prog uh, differential equations and uh, mm -hmm. um, kind of predict epidemia. But do you have something else where we can use it? Yeah, um, I mean basically any you can use it for any task that is um, let's say inspired by by I don't know. In my case, it would probably be physics or financial modeling, right? Where you have tasks of which you know that they are they are grounded on mathematics. Um, so for example, we will probably apply them to learning um, like really complicated magnetic fields uh, of, of tiny robots or yeah, well, like stuff like that, where you kind of know that the underlying task is composed of these arithmetic operations. Mm -hmm. And the second why, did you try, um, again, you show that it's POC, so the question is, did you try to solve more complex equations with matrices of higher dimensions? Um, so matrices of higher dimensions would be like tensors, right, I guess? Uh, yeah, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is really like our latest uh, state, of, state of the art, let's say. Uh, we have a bunch of different directions where we want to try this out, right? And also using um, using this neural arithmetic into in larger networks, uh, but we haven't gotten to that yet. Okay, so guys, if you have, and uh, guys and ladies for sure. So if you have any questions, we can meet uh, with Nicholas in our networking session and you can ask him personally about it. And now we'll go to the uh, lightning talks. Um, and uh, the first one is going to be Peter Marek. Peter, is, are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, perfect, because I don't see the whole screen. So, and Peter, he's um, um, an NLP researcher in Promises AI, and also he's a, a winner of uh, Alexa Prize for a couple of years for chatbot competition. So, and Petr will tell us about difference between research in academia, corporate, and startup. All right, thank you, Ali. So, hello, my name is Petr Marek, and before I will start, I would like to introduce myself. I'm researcher of conversational AI. I'm part of Team Alquist, which is competing in international competition called Amazon Alexa Prize. I spent the last two summers conducting research in Amazon Development Center Lab 126 in California and I'm working in a startup company, Prometheus AI, and I'm also pursuing my PhD in conversational AI at Czech Technical University. And for those reasons, I was asked by the organizers of this meetup to tell you what are the differences in research of AI in academia and industry. So for the academia part, I have an experience from my PhD and from Alquist. My PhD is completely academic as it can get, and Alquist is most a university project although it is not just the research, it's also application with thousands of users. And for the industry part, I have experience of working at Amazon, which is a huge corporate, and they do research on a large scale. And from Prometheus AI, which is a startup company, so it is on the opposite side of the spectrum. And when I was preparing for my presentation and trying to find opinions and experiences of others in order to bring you wider perspective, I found out that opinions don't differ much. The experience of most people which tried both academic and industry research is that in academia, you have much more freedom to explore, invent and try new approaches that don't have to necessarily lead to immediate results. On the other hand, in industry, you have much more limit, you are much more limited in what you can do because it must work and generate some value at the end of the day. Uh, but you have more resources at your disposal usually. I think that most of you intuitively know that or it doesn't surprise you much. So instead of this cliche, I decided that it would be much better idea to share with you uh, three stories. The three stories that show what I have learned about the actual differences in academic and industrial research. So the first story is about Alquist and about how nobody cared. So this story starts in 2017, when our team Alquist was selected to compete in an international student competition Alexa Prize organized by Amazon. The goal of this competition is to create a conversational AI capable of having coherent and engaging conversation about popular topics like movies, sports or music. 
And the grand challenge of this competition is to have 20 minutes long conversation, but this line haven't been reached yet. So Amazon selected 12 teams, most of them from top public US universities, and each team developed a conversational AI. Those AIs were then available to anyone in the US who had an, an Echo device. Uh, they said, Alexa, let's chat. One of the conversational AI was randomly selected. Users had a conversation, and they rated for it from one to five stars after it, based on how satisfied they were. And to be honest, this was the first year of the competition, so nobody knew exactly how to approach this challenge. So we started with what we knew. We developed some baseline machine learning algorithms for intent recognition, named entity recognition, and dialogue management. And once baselines worked, we started to improve them. This is what most of researchers in academia usually do. They have some baseline as a starting point, and then they improve it in order to write a paper. So we did it too. Uh, we improved the performance of intent recognition model by a few percent. We are getting a daily reports of ratings we obtained from the users, so we expected that it will rise after its improvement. <laughs> but what do you think? We were quite surprised that it didn't grow at all. So we improved a model for named entity recognition. And we didn't believe it again. The ratings stayed the same. So we tried to improve the models for the last time in the desperate move to increase our ratings but still nothing. There had to be something wrong. And then someone had an idea to try something else. Let's improve the content of the conversational AI. And just to be clear, we weren't using any generative models at that time. We wrote all the responses by hand and models just selected the best one based on the context of the dialogue. Uh, so on one hand, we improved what the August was already saying, and we also added more conversational topics. So we added dialogues about video games and ratings slightly improved. And then we added music, a slight grow again. Uh, so we added fashion and again, can you see the pattern? The ratings slightly improved with each topic we added. So what is the reason? The reason is that if you improve your accuracy, for example, by 3% as we did, nobody will notice in most cases. It's just a too small improvement in comparison to the rest of the problems we faced. It can be a good material for a paper, but at least our users didn't care. I also see the recent trend is to get better results simply by growing the size of the model. And it is dangerous path to take because users will probably not know this, but your wallet will, because you will have to pay more for the cloud infrastructure you run your bigger model on. There is always the cost to performance ratio, which we sometimes forget about. So the second story is from summer of year 2019, when I was interning at Amazon. And it's about how quality mattered. So I was given a chance to have an internship at Amazon thanks to Alexa Price competition. So I ended up in the lab 126 in California, where I was part of Alexa AI team which is responsible for the development of a new AI algorithms. So I had an opportunity to learn and be part of a research visit, which is conducted on a large scale and which is really business oriented. But before I will continue, I have to make clear that all I will say is my personal opinion and I don't represent Amazon. They simply require me to say that every time before I will talk about the internship. And also I will talk more generally because I can't disclose any details. So I was placed in the team of mostly researchers and my goal was to conduct some research and bring some results at the end of the internship. And you can all probably imagine that I started the internship by cloning some GitHub repository. It's obvious. So I created my own branch and started to write code to run experiments. And you probably know how it works. You cut corner here and there to simplify your life, to get numbers faster. Well, my life was easy. Not for long though, problems emerged around the middle of my internship. Because my manager, and he was from the Belgium, told me, well, your results are promising. We would like to integrate your code in the main branch. So make a CR. And I was like, what is CR? And he answered me, well, it's code review. 
Uh, coach what? Oh, well, do you remember those few cut corners? Yeah, they did some changes to the code, which prevented easy merge requests into main branch. Well, fortunately, there was also Bill in the team. And it might, might, it might surprise you because despite his very American sounding name, he was a Chinese. And he was one of the dedicated software engineers in the research team. And his purpose was to make sure that all the code is clean and everything is running smoothly from the software engineering perspective. So he helped me a lot to make everything right. Well, up to that moment, it was always just me and maximally a few guys from the office running experiments. And we were writing some code and it just worked at our scale. But suddenly I was part of a much larger team. And in larger team, it's not just about numbers, obviously. It's also about the quality of the code. Because if the code is clean and easy to understand, others other team members can use it and build on top of it. So for me, the lessons learned was that in industry, the quality of code matters and good companies have dedicated people who are responsible for that. And the third story I have for you today is from my recent startup, Prometheus AI. And it's about how data changed. So in Prometheus AI, our mission is to develop a platform for development of conversational AI voice first applications. And our goal, which we aim to achieve, is to be able to create a first AI therapist with human level empathy, em empathy and understanding. We see it as one of the hardest tasks there are today in conversational AI. So each step we take towards it will dramatically improve the abilities of conversational AI in all other domains as well. Also, we understood from the beginning that we can't achieve this task alone. We need domain experts that would help us because we understand machine learning and others from our startup understand software development, but nobody really understand the underlying psych psychology of human conversation. So we added linguists and psychologists into our team. And those people have completely different background than us. They are not that technical, but they are great at understanding how conversations work. And because of our differences, you can imagine that we hadn't an easy start. Both sides had to learn a lot. For example, one of their tasks is to design a conversation out of which we generate training data for our models. And you know how it works in machine learning. The data set is usually some text file, at least in the field of natural language processing, with a format that is easy to read for computers, but hard to follow for people. Well, it's definitely not a Microsoft Office that the ordinary people are used to, which we learn a hard way. Another thing we learn is that in research, you have a fixed data set on which you train your machine learning algorithm. It is fixed so you can reproduce your results, but it wasn't the case in this story. It was more like, Hey, I created a new conversation. Can you please add it into the system? And after some times, uh, I have made a new, uh, a few changes. It sounds more natural now. Can you include it, please? And after some time again, you know, I added few more formulation of the answer. That was really the last chance uh, change. I was satisfied finally. So we had to manually train the model each time there was any change made in the data and we had to integrate it into the system. We spent uh, quite a lot of time on this manual task, which we could have spent on improving our technology. So it wasn't sustainable in the long run. Well, the solution fitted into the mission of the company quite nicely. It was to develop a system which would enable non-technical people to create new conversational data, and most importantly, to retrain our models automatically uh, on it completely without us. It was quite large investment for us initially because software developers from our team had to develop a system for data and model versioning for automatic training. And we researchers had to come up with models that works re reliably on diverse and small amount of training data and that train fast. But we saw multiple benefits quickly. We researchers have now much more time for actual research the system served as a starting point for a whole platform that covers multiple aspects of conversational AI development. And domain experts can iterate their work much faster so they can improve the abilities of a conversational AI at pace, which we haven't been imaginable to us before. 
So the difference I see from my perspective is that in pure research, you work with stationary data set in most of the times, and it influences the type of models we develop. But at least in our startup, it is not the case. We are facing data that are changing at a fast pace, and thus we face completely different set of problems. And we need to account for that in our models. For example, we need our models to be trained as fast as possible. So the domain experts don't have to wait a long time to see the results of their work. And I think it is sometimes overlooked by some academic research. So that was the last story. Uh, what are the take home messages for you? Well, I demonstrated to you that in real applications, nobody will probably notice a slight improvement in the model's accuracy, although it is something we are making papers about. I showed you that in large companies, the research is not just about running experiments, but it is about clean code that can be understood and modified by other people too. And also that in practice, you might encounter a problems in which it is beneficial for you to create a tools for non-technical people to create and modify training data for your machine learning models. And thus it is important to focus also on properties that are overlooked by some papers, like time it takes to train your model. So thank you. I am Promet uh, I'm Peter Marek from Prometheist AI. Thank you, Mark. It was great. Um, so first of all, uh, we're keeping uh, fingers crossed because Elquist AI is also and this finalist for this year competition. So we hope we wish you good luck with this and also Thank good you. luck with your startup. Hopefully you. it will be uh, successful. And we have uh, quite a lot of questions for you. We'll take top four. Oh. And uh, uh, the first one is in any of the like surprises years, what improvement in methods models had the biggest positive impact? Uh, it's a bit sad to say, but we didn't see so much improvement in the like model quality. But I think that the biggest influence is simply like user experience. So supporting more topics, uh, being to be able to answer more uh, more questions, stuff like that. So yeah, like the and they have an extra also, question. Also, also, sorry. Also, one of the big improvement or mm, was, I think that most of the team improved their uh, way how they add new content. If you add more content faster, then it will satisfy more users. Yeah. Okay, and one more question. I know that you uh, had an Alexa one data sets. Uh, did you with time improve like with uh, different sources of data? data? No, oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Uh, so I know that a couple of years ago you presented that you used one data set and now you talked about different data that we need mm -hmm. like different sources of data and how quality they are. Did you also improve it with um, new data? Well, basically, yes, we are adding more data, but uh, okay. like if we want to include a new conversational topic, we need a data for that. And you can imagine that if you want to uh, add a conversation about gardening or fishing, there are no data sets available on the internet which covers these topics. Yeah, maybe you can like, don't want some subreddits and there are some comments, but they are not usually representing a real conversation. So like the data are really biased. So this is the reason why we developed a system that allow us to create our own data, basically, like how we want the conversation to look like. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, would you say that in industry, it's more teamwork and cooperation? Would you say that in academia is more interested to go to dig deeper in each problem? Yes, I totally agree. Because like the in the industry, it's always the or at least in the corporate, like in, in startup, it's different. It's it's closer to academia, I would say. But in the corporate, for example, my experience for Amazon was that suddenly I was part of a huge team and there was uh, like many persons and they influenced my work too. And I was also working, I was, in academia, you usually start from scratch or you clone some GitHub repo and you somehow modify it, but it's still like, 90% it is your work, but in the corporate, it, 
your starting point is much further because you have something to build on top of. Thank you. And again, the question about data, I guess it's uh, popular. Can you say more about fast model retraining with new data? Well, yeah. Um, I would say that we are just limited in the type of models which we can use. For example, we could use BERT for dialogue management or for intent classification, but it is not viable for us because the training takes time and we really need results fast. So for this reason, we are, I would say, a bit stuck with the much simpler methods that works reliably and train fast. So we can deliver results in a matter of like seconds and not minutes or hours. Thank you. And the last question, um, if you were to start up industry academia, is it, if you will start from scratch, for example, if you're a student, so what you would go for? Uh, well, if I'm a student, it's definitely you should start in academia because in, as a student, you are basically already in academia. But uh, if I have to choose now something, I already made the choice. I selected the startup. So. Okay. Uh, all the rest questions, Marek, if I could ask you, could you uh, post them on Zoom uh, chat? Yeah. And Marek, if you will be so kind to answer it there. Okay. Thank you, Marek, for your presentation. And the next is uh, on the list is Tamash Tunis. Tamash Tunis is a head of research in uh, Rosmoyai, which they co-founded, I think, four years ago with uh, also colleagues from CTU. And he will tell us about his research to, uh, to value. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so let me just, uh, all right. So uh, before I start, uh, uh, thank you, Nicholas, uh, for the great presentation and uh, to Peter uh, to great segue to my talk because much of what you said is my experience as well. Um, uh, so my talk is called Research to Value but I should have used like a founder's view on the differences between academia and uh, startup research. So as Ellie said, I'm Tomasz Tunis. Uh, I'm head of research uh, at Rossum. And um, here's a short overview of my presentation, uh, a really quick one slide presentation uh, about Rossum what we do uh, and then my two cents, my two points about the differences between academia and uh, startup uh, in terms of research. So uh, as Ali said, Rossum was founded about four years ago um, by three PhD dropouts when I'm one of them. So I have some quite of experience with academia uh, we have right now about 60, like 60 ish people, where uh, 10 people are in research, uh, which is quite a big ratio, uh, actually. And there was a time not so long ago where we had more researchers than salesmen, actually. Um, so before I tell you what we do in Rossum, I want to want you to contemplate about a problem, a real life problem that somewhere in the world there is uh, there is a person that uh, prints out a document from a computer and sends it to another company where someone just takes the takes the document you know and uh, rewrites the data from that document into the target system that is basically completely different from the source source system so the endpoints cannot communicate together or they communicate via, via a human centric medium, which is a document, which currently computers cannot understand. And that's kind of the mission of Rossum, or one of the missions, one of the goals is to teach computers to understand documents. Uh, so when we started, we thought that it will be just like build a, machine learning system like an engine that will work as a 
REST API that, you know, four years ago, it was the time when you know, it was sexy to have some kind of um, machine learning API, such as document classification or whatever. So we thought that we will build just an REST API where you can upload a document, be it a PDF or an image, and we will extract the data uh, and present it to you uh, in JSON, let's say. And we, fit, we thought that that will be it. We can do business uh, and with that, and that we have learned the hard lesson that it's not that easy. And uh, actually, the image on the right, you can see the one of the first documents that we pre like, like processed and shows kind of the data extracted, the fields highlighted, and it was really just a static page where you could look at uh, look at the results, and that was it basically. So it was kind of working like send it and pray for the best. And that was the issue, basically, uh, not only it. Uh, so we gradually build around this API a whole tool for businesses to effectively like communicate, uh, I would dare to say effortlessly, uh, to communicate or deal with a influx of uh, documents in, into, their, into their companies. And yeah, this is how the system kind of changed. And we have like beautiful, beautiful AI, UI and AI is also beautiful, but UI is where the people can actually validate the, the data, uh, can set up some business rules for which if the document is extracted with something like high confidence, it can be automated and so on. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, machine learning, uh, a lot of machine learning ideas built into it, but you have to, kind of uh, wrap it into a great package that actually helps because the AI, you know, it's just a kind of a hype word. Um, every startup basically nowadays has an AI somewhere in the in the feature list. And, you know, AI is not, or the machine learning models to be precise are not perfect and you need to kind of uh, make up for it. So that's basically what we do at Russell. Uh, so I'm quite slow. So the first, first main point and first and the main point of my talk is the, the research goal and the difference in, what it, and the main difference in academia uh, and uh, startups when we talk about goals. And yeah, I'll use a, as a introduction, uh, this, this is one of my favorite quotes. I think it's called Goodhart's Law and it's a paraphrase of it. Uh, and it says when a metric becomes a target, it ceases to be a good metric. Uh, and it comes in all sorts of different flavors. Uh, the, the one that I kind of chose is more subtle and controversial maybe, because uh, it's a question, basically the, the difference between startup uh, and research in startup and academia is basically quite substantial, I would say, and at least from my experience. Uh, it's a question of, of why versus what uh, you are optimizing for. And in, in a startup, you are basically not, your target is not to be the next metric or make a like a state of the art model to say, uh, don't get me wrong, it is, but it's not the main goal. It's just an instrumental goal to deliver a value to someone else or have a greater goal, which in this case of any company, it's just, you have to deliver a, value to a customer to do business so it's easy in case of academia you you just don't have this clear idea of what's your or maybe you do have but i don't want to be i am talking about in in general that you don't know maybe what's your customer and that's maybe a huge or i've definitely fell victim into this mindset of beating the next or being the next state of the art and and I consider it a big mistake, at least at the current moment. Uh, so what's the problem from my point of view is of not having a idea of a customer, not like a customer in case of academia, is that you don't care about as much about the code you produce. That means that if you ever publish it, like it might be not usable by others or it's uh, completely irreduce, uh, irreproducible so the others cannot basically take it, run it, and reproduce your results because you are sloppy about careful specification of parameters 
and you can see it definitely a lot uh, in different publications. You just you cannot replicate the results, and I would say quite a substantial amount of the public research is not uh, is not reproducible, basically. And the next point uh, is like uh, you will do all crazy stuff, and don't get me wrong. In a startup, you will do all crazy stuff as well, but you have to make it uh, maintainable and everything. In case of research, you will do crazy stuff just to beat the state of the art and be the best and publish a paper. So you will produce completely unpractical solutions. And one of the examples is quote unquote Netflix price. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's true or not actually. So I don't know, want to uh, make a false statement, but it just as, a, as an example. And I don't know if you knew about, know about Netflix price, but it's really old, I guess. Uh, the idea was that the Netflix published uh, anonymized data and anyone that beat their solution by, I don't know, 10% uh, would get, I don't know how many millions of dollars. And, and the final solution was actually an ensemble of, I don't know how many groups and different things. So in the end, despite the fact that, yeah, that's the, that's the false idea. Uh, that they cannot use that uh, solution just because it was produced by all the different like research groups or people. Uh, I mean, it's from the point of view that it was un totally unpractical. It was so huge and everything, and you cannot just run it uh, and maintain such huge models and everything. It's just hell of a mess. And that's my like, message main message is for any researcher in here it's just like find your quote unquote customer and mainly adopt this mindset like that there should be some bigger goal i know it's hard because you have to publish it yeah it's i don't know whether the situation kind of change in reviews if you let's say have the same result as someone else but your solution is uh, twice as fast if it's easy to like get it publishing get it published but i don't know but being in it just for the game is also fine so i don't mean it in i don't want to force any ideas on anyone i just uh, i definitely fell victim to this mindset of beating it as i said and i think that was wrong in retrospect uh, all right and i would like to uh, i've made the presentation and then someone from our, some our researcher just pointed out to me that there was uh, a talk given by Christopher Bishop uh, in Neurips like two days ago, I guess. And it's really great talk about like about similar thing I've talked about. It's about like really how you can do basic research. You can argue that this, what I said is not applicable in basic, basic research, but that's not entirely true because you can still do basic research like uh, uh, with applications in today's to, in like today uh, with current technology and everything uh, you certainly can and Rosum does that and as well as their research group uh, it's a great talk and very motivating so I encourage you to take a look at it uh, all right and that's leave me with the next point which is the role of a researcher and the, again, the difference in the academia and and startup, which is actually, I would say, is practically the same. It depends on the startup, uh, depends like, yeah. Uh, but in if I uh, tell it from the point of view of Rossum, I don't see that much differences per se. Uh, like people maybe have this idea that when you do research in a startup or any company, uh, you will do, I don't know, uh, write some equations on a, on a whiteboard or whatever, and just, just write some M MVP, like a code and that's it. Uh, that's certainly not the case. You have to do a lot of, a lot of work around, um, and it has to work and it has to be kind of the same as in academia. You, you, you are solving a problem. You have to write a lot of code around just to make the let's say the your experiments you want to experiment a lot so you need need to build your own framework to say that uh, you run these multiple experiments do grid search or whatever you need to have some kind of uh, analytics 
like error analysis tools. So you build a lot of lot of things that actually you will do the same in in a startup. Uh, um, so um, that's that. Um, it's really really interesting. And this this uh, this uh, uh, crop is from from this paper called Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems, which I would say any any company or machine learning based company can write their own books about like these technical debts and and problems they face. Uh, so just to go through the points uh, uh, and what are, might be the differences, uh, I say they are practically the same, but uh, they are also not the same. So arguably more challenging is the research in 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 a startup because there's a lot more work to do actually and it has to work and you work in a bigger team as same things uh, Peter uh, said before me. Uh, and actually you are not facing a clearly defined problem. You might define it for yourself. You need to pick the right metrics again to measure it so that you know what you are delivering. You might have to prepare guidelines for data collection. There is also a pressure like to deliver on time. There are some like milestones and deadlines that you need to meet. And that's, again, in academia, you have you have to publish for so their kind of deadlines as well, but it's not that strict, I would say. Uh, and in academia, you usually do not, you, know, you may choose metrics, but they usually need to compare yourself with some, some other solutions. So you cannot choose maybe the metrics and data collection you have to use some publicly available data again just to be in in perfect situation in order to be reproducible or comparable with the others again so in in the startup you basically as a researcher you have to do all of this uh for like it's much more work and it has to be you cannot just code for yourself uh, because you work in a bigger team so and that said, uh, you actually both in academia and startup, you and everyone will develop their own framework for like, again, doing this uh, training. And actually in the case of startup, you need to have a deployment. All of that has to be automated. Uh, and Resume is not an exception. Uh, I think everyone, there is not no such thing as a, like a general framework that you can actually use because there will be specific needs like we have the same situation, like uh, Peter said, that we are retraining the models. It, it, needs, it needs to be basically easy to do, automated in like, like it runs for, let's say there are certain trainings that run for a long time. It has to be reliable so that it doesn't fail. And if it fails, it has to be again, restart or assumable and so on. So there is a lot more care that needs to be put inside of it. and depending on the size of the startup, uh, it's either a researcher or a research engineer, because in my experience, like researchers are not the best programmers. Uh, maybe that has changed as well, but, uh, um, you know, uh, and Rossum definitely at the beginning, most of the work did the researchers even on the frameworks around that. Um, yeah, and same applies, basically same idea, I guess, applies to academia when you are in a research group or as an individual, you will basically need kind of similar way or, or do things. Uh, the framework, you need to build your own framework. The only difference is, again, you can have a Slack. You just, uh, the difference is, is that you don't have to keep the, it maintain, like maintainability when you are on your own. It's your own kind of problem. You are the author, you know most of the things so you can change it quickly. But once you are working with a bigger team, it might be a problem. So so that's that. You don't need to care about deployment. Maybe, I don't know uh, if, if you are in a bigger group that actually has some kind of uh, like bigger, bigger, bigger picture maybe that they can, someone else can use. And there are examples that they, they have public APIs and someone else can use that. So that might not be completely true, but you definitely, I, I think in most cases, no one need to care about deployment and uptime as well. So 
that's that's that and yeah that's my two cents on the matter and thank you for your attention and yeah i will look forward to the questions because it was maybe a bit controversial but yeah let's see thank you Tamash, for your presentation and we have like five questions we'll take probably a couple of them and first is mm -hmm. uh, having a practical motivation sounds good, but as a researcher, I could not do all of it. It's very good detailed experiments uh, and a good code. So any idea what to do? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I have kind of expected that. I think it's kind of an excuse, <laughs> really. Personally, I think it's like, like you, it depends really. Uh, if you are on your own and just doing a theory and just doing it for the sake of the theory itself and just moving some yeah i mean who am i to tell you that you should write better code i mean my point is maybe more yeah uh, yeah i would stick with that it's maybe more controversial learn to code make better code because once you leave i don't know if your plans are to leave academia or maybe to become a founder or of a ai or a machine learning uh, startup so you will be on your own from the beginning and believe me you will pay for it in the long run because when you code most of the things then when people come and will look at it wow like i could ask my people in in Russell what they think because about my code I, I definitely not not i'm not the best coder myself but i would try to adopt this again this mindset about not necessarily hacking everything and trying to Trying your best, I think, yeah. Okay, so the next question, are you using some existing OCR system uh, or have you created oh. your own? Uh, that's a good question. We have actually created our own. We have a two, two system, two OCR system, you might say in, uh, in the, like in the traditional sense, the OCR is actually open source because it was made by Milan Troller in like the beginning of Brossum and he actually took the what is it called the Serac I think it was at the time it was I think version 4 alpha or something on LSTMs or Blue and he just like worked on that and we actually made it open source what we use is a little bit different now but yeah we built our own thank you uh, from PhD dropout to head of research, uh, was it hard not only to drive research, but also people in your team? Uh, no, actually. Well, let me dissect it. Was it hard not only to drive research, but also people? Oh, you mean like if I do like research or like I'm actually, I'm just managing the people, but most of the research I'm actually, that's kind of, good thing i can only point out over the the direction but most of the things are doing our researchers i would say even the whole thing like the whole idea we have let's say a we need have a problem to solve and i'm actually not the one i'm not like micromanaging how we will approach it and everything i think we have that's that's a great mindset of we have like our researchers are individuals that can like propose their own like ideas so i'm actually not doing research sadly but i have no time for it and uh, it's again, hard for me i'm i'm not like uh yeah public speaking is really hard for me and dealing with people is also very hard for me but i kind of manage but if i was to choose what i would like to do i would definitely do research like that's my thing, but I think, yeah, we will grow and I will get to that as well, maybe, and someone someone else replaces me in, in head of research. Thank you. And uh, do you, in the awesome research, write the code for production or you need quality code just for mental ability, understanding and other purposes? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you know the answer. Uh, yeah, we write, our researchers are basically writing production code, or at least there is no two phase, like that you create some kind of prototype or someone else will code the production version of your code. So we right now are in this mode. I don't know if it's the good approach or not. Uh, there's certain like, yeah, you can 
make it both ways. Uh, but where we are at right now, then our researchers really need to produce good code and working code because it goes to production. So that's that. And actually, I want to mention also that in Rossum, they do a code review, which works both way. Like first juniors do code review and then seniors do code review, which helps a lot to uh, learn um, yep. both ways. So I think it's yeah. actually a good point to Petr Marek saying, hey, we are doing code review. They don't have special people, but they're trying to kind of adapt yep. it that everybody learns. Yeah, and, that's uh, definitely one one like great point because like in academia you don't do that at all i think like no one just no one cares but like uh, you you have to have the code that works and is maintainable and tested ideally and everything because it needs to work and you cannot just like patch everything and yeah like that's completely different story like uh, it's more of a software engineering kind of like programming than like research but um, yeah, it's good to adopt the, these practices in research as well. Thank you so much for your talk. And I will finish it with a comment from one of our uh, listeners that it, not doing research is, not, uh, is an excuse. So please find time not only managing people, but doing a research. <laughs> okay, okay uh, uh, I wonder who was that? Left. Like, who was that? <laughs> <laughs> there is one more left question uh, in uh, a slider, so please answer it in the chat. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we are going to talk with Martin Rehak, and uh, he's a co-founder or founder, I'm not sure which tells it is, of Resistant AI. And uh, he will tell us about that startups are doing too much research. So thank you very much. So let me share my screen and we can start. So hello, my name is Martin, and I've been basically working on machine learning and security for the last 15 years or so together with my team. So we are all co-founders. There is no one who calls himself just founder. And uh, what I want to share is my experience with startups and research, because I did enough of both. The Who we are, basically, la, we started research in academia in 2005, when we were already working for US DOD projects. And we had a choice between optimizing missile delivery, which means killing as many people as possible with minimal number of missiles, or doing network security. There were three companies in the same field just went bankrupt and out of business. So we still picked network security, and we decided that that was the way to go. And we spun off from the university, built a startup called Cognitive Security, uh, got VC funding by Credo Ventures as their first ever investment, and got bought by Cisco in 2013. And since uh, then, I spent a couple of years in Cisco. Uh, I was there with Tomáš Pevny, who's, I guess, on the call as well. So he was one of the other fa like founders and early members of Cognitive. And when I was leaving uh, two years ago, we were at 25 million users and the team is now at 50 million users globally. So it's still growing very in a very healthy manner. The team behind Resistant AI is very technical. Uh, most of the co-founders have PhDs. So over so many years, we finished our PhDs. Together, we have hundreds of patents and papers in AI and security, and we published in conferences and journals. And one thing that we believe is being transparent and fair. So we never promise something we can't deliver. We always give straight truth to the customer because even if we may lose some customers early on, we keep the customers we have for years and they don't leave. Which helped us to get backing of funds like Index Ventures, Credo and Seedcamp for the new startup, Persistent AI, which is very bluntly protecting AI and machine learning from humans because uh, machine learning is currently very vulnerable, very fragile, and you can easily steal plenty of money by attacking machine learning models that are deployed in financial domain, which is exactly what we do. We are growing very quickly. Right now we have 28 people in the company up from 12 a year ago. And if anyone wants to try an internship 
or a job with us, we are very open to taking new people on, if you can fit with the culture. So let me talk, give you my subjective view on startups. First, I believe that to make a successful startup, you need to foot, fit into a disruption. So there needs to be a change in the world around you, which allows you to build something successful in the place that didn't exist before. It could be technology change or it could be a market change. And the only constant for a startup to be successful is that there needs to be some change, which means instability. And then you have a look at the startups from US perspective and European perspective, which is actually way different. In the US, startups always start from the market. So a group of people who know some market, they know the problem and then they set out to solve the problem. They don't care about technology at the beginning. They don't care about the means of solution. They really care about the market and the product. And in the last moment, once they can't do it anymore, they can't stand it, they start investing into technology. In Europe, it's a very different. And my example is included in that. You start at the university. So most of us around here, like guys at Rossum, ourselves, we started at the university. You have some kind of technology that you want to build or you are already building as I did. Then you slowly turn the technology into product. And I can tell you funny stories how we showed histograms to users in the network operation centers and we were shocked they didn't like it. And that was my first GUI that we have written as researchers. And after that, if when you build a product and you have a couple of users, you start to test whether there is a market where someone wants to use this and whether you can actually make money. And that's basically what gets Europe where we are now, which means we have only a fraction of global investment in startups and only a fraction of success. A really good analysis of that comes from Nicolas Collin, who's a French investor and administrator. And this is a brief summary of one of the blog posts he has written. By the way, if you run a startup, it's a really good thing to read. And one thing he says, and this is, I don't always agree with Nicolas, by the way, but it's really good to read opinions of people where you don't agree with everything they say, because that helps you grow. So in his opinion, people who start startups in Europe need to understand that technology is not the same thing as innovation. The fact that you have the best algorithm around doesn't mean that you will achieve something meaningful for the world. As Petra has said a couple of minutes ago, the fact that you improve something by 2% doesn't help you to win in the market. No one notices. Second opinion is that startups don't need to bother with research and development because they typically change their focus, objective, or the problem before you can finish the R&D activity on a strategic scale. So again, talking cheap, but uh, let's say that the unstable environment changes stakes quite dramatically. And R&D matters, but only for large tech companies that can put it into business and turn it to money. It's the turning to money part of these startups that is really problematic. You can do any kind of R&D you want. If you can't monetize it, it's a waste of your time and effort. There is one exception, and that's what's typically called biotech exception. And in biotechnology, you always, always, you always know you have a customer and you know how many, because you basically make people's lives better. You know how many people they are and you, many, you know how many people do have certain illness. So if you can cure that illness or solve an issue, you have a market. The success rate of startups in biotechnology is still less than 1%, meaning less than 1% of them don't go bankrupt. But those that don't go bankrupt make huge amounts of money and they return the investment. Because big pharma companies have, with few exceptions, stopped doing research. The way how everything works is that you build something as a startup. You have 99% chance of failure. Then if you succeed, you sell that startup to a large company that makes 10x money with your technology. And that's what is actually deep tech in software. That's how road works. And uh, if you look into how European Union supports startups, they support technology and collaboration between university and small companies. 
which in this view is completely nonsensical. You shouldn't do that because there is no way how you invest into a strategic research project done by the university with some exceptions because we are actually investing into one with Václav and Vitek who are on this call and make money on the scale of a small startup. It's a non-trivial issue because the ROI, return on investment, is not big enough. And that's why Silicon Valley companies love technology investments by European governments because they end up picking up most of the return and most of the money that comes out of those investments because they have a machine that turns that technology into money. So is this view of Nicola Collan true? So let's see our own experience. Cognitive security was a deep tech startup. We had massive investments into R&D. We had substantial US and Czech government funding. And still, we can say in the hindsight that about 60% of research efforts spent before Cisco acquisition was basically ineffective. And it was never used or it never made money in production. We invested massively into building peer-to-peer -peer optimized system that was really great for battlefield use, except there was no battle, luckily, to be fought between technologically advanced adversaries on the actual battlefield. Everything moved to the cloud, which means that all of the self-configuration research we did was irrelevant because we could manage everything in the cloud and managing something directly is much cheaper than writing AI code to manage other AI code. So that's basically a huge change. You can easily see yourself made irrelevant by a change that's getting, that's happening next to you, in this case, appearance of cloud. Second, political influence. Snowden leaked his discoveries and suddenly all of the internet traffic started to be encrypted so basically in two years, we went from 20% encrypted to 20% non-encrypted. And at that point, I had to stop all of the research projects going in that direction and started doing completely new research about breaking encryption or analyzing encrypted traffic, because that was what it's. And third thing, corporations are essentially machines built or tech corporations, machines built to make money out of technology research which means that most of the research you do as a scientist in a big corporation never gets deployed because it's very cheap to do research. You have 10 or 15 ideas, you let them fight, and then you pick one which you may put on the market because you, you have only so many things you can build on the engineering, marketing, and sales level. So that's the real benefit for the research in corporate environment. You can do it but unless you have a way how to get it to the market, it doesn't matter. It will never get used. And still, with all of these, it matters. Because if you take a technology that's built by a couple of guys in Prague and deploy that to cover 50 million seats of users in large corporations, you make plenty of money because you have the scale. And at that point, you can really afford to lose and write of 80% of research if you have good results in those remaining 20 percent and that's what have actually happens in a big corporations so as i said we were bought in the economically same model as big pharma companies by small pharma startups our technology was used to make plenty of money at scale which we could never achieve as a small startup at that point and we learned how to optimize research investments in a large corporation so plenty of experience is shared by Petra with Amazon, actually I laid them from the other side because I was the one who was telling Petrus uh, to stop doing this because it will never make money. So how to do, what is the economic outcome? First, if you have as a startup more than one uncertainty, you are going to fail most likely. So if you build a new product on a new market with unproven technology, you are going to have very hard time raising money for that because investors don't like two risks which means if you don't get money you go bust in terms of validation when startups exit they mostly get buoy by other companies or they get ipo and they are very lucky if you get bought by other company and you have a working business with slightly worse technology you get much more money out of that than perfect technology with no business. 
And I saw that I was on the acquiring side when Cisco was buying other startups. And this was exactly what was in the Excel sheet. Because the value of the risk is much lower in the case you already have a working business and you saw and you can show people paying money for what you do, even if the efficacy is 2% lower. Big companies can deal with research necessary to push those 2% up. They can't deal with building the machine that makes money out of that innovation. And as I said, big bio research is an exception to that. So what to do? How to run research in a startup? First, forget everything you learned in academia. Because time horizons are different, you iterate over, you don't plan, you iterate, and every three months you do something completely different, at least in our experience. In academia, you want to something to run once on one data set so that you can publish at an IFPS or at some other conference. So you need code that's super fragile, super optimized. And if you give it to someone else, it will run on exactly the same data you had once and give him the same numbers. So it's replicable. This is not the kind of code you can put to production. It would kill you immediately. Because you need much more robust code because you are dealing with, in our case, criminals that actively try to avoid being detected. So they try to break your code intentionally. You should consider whether you publish because putting something to production is actually easier than publishing that at a conference. So as a startup, in the second startup, we stop publishing because we don't see the ROI simply. And you should consider whether you should publish because as a startup, one of the few reasons why to do research is building a competitive advantage over the others. If you share everything you build without protection, it ends up not being a competitive differentiation. And patents, don't patent like disruptive ideas because typically you can't defend those ideas. What you should patent if you want to invest your money into that, which is highly questionable, is efficiency improvements. So if you have something that makes you on the market 10% uh, better than the other, it means you are going to win more business and make more money that's much more important than preventing others from getting into the market at all. So these are my experiences. And I apologize if I went over time. Thank you, Martin. Thank you a lot for your presentation. Um, so uh, ask, please ask questions. There are already three questions in Slido. And we'll start the first one. Uh, we're afraid to do a security startup when there is a big market of big whales as Cisco last asset. So at that point, well, Cisco was the biggest security company when we were starting. It was making about billion dollars a year in security, uh, which now they make about five or six. And the security market increased by a factor of 100. So I, don't, I would say that competition doesn't matter. Really. What matter? What about was, competition between? I'm sorry. Uh, what about competition between startups? Like, very few startups go out of business because there is uh, they basically lose with competition. It's not impossible in the security market where now we have two thousand security companies, most of them startups. So that's very much possible, but that's not the case of Czech startups. They typically have very good technology and they can deliver if they promise something. Much more common issue is that startups build something that basically is already obsolete. So it's a soft problem that doesn't need to be solved again, or that people don't have a need for. Cognitive security was ultimately successful because of Chinese government program to steal IP in the rest of the world and take it to China. And that increased investment into cybersecurity and made it a huge industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, you said that you have seven PhDs in your team. Do you really think that in order to do research, PhD is required? So I, th I don't think so. The what you need is a mind that's capable of getting a PhD. You need curiosity, you need inquisitiveness, you need like willingness to explore and try new things and creativity. All those things are necessary. Whether you get a paper saying that or not, it's completely 
irrelevant. No one ever asked me to show my diploma. I never used it once. I got it, I put it to my drawer, and that's it. So I would say that PhD is a useless piece of paper, unless you want to have a career in academia, obviously. Uh, it's just also my comment about it. When I see a lot of um, job requirements, uh, it's quite common that they write like PhD required in this domain. So I'm actually, um, I'm thinking that maybe it's obsolete to write PhD required, but actually write that a required uh, curious mind, like in some different wording, but because a lot of people saying, hey, if I want to work as a researcher, I need to go for PhD and then spend seven years doing PhD and like this may be no result. The, uh, very pragmatically, I think that Many people push for PhDs to be included as requirements because it gives students to their university friends so that they have a cheap source of labor. <laughs> and I was a cheap source of labor at one point. So that's reality of PhD studies. If you, if you want to get a PhD, do it with the intent of being in the academia and teaching or doing it for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. But you don't need PhD today to get into startups or into machine learning research. Thank you. And uh, what is your experience of research cooperation between universities and companies? So actually very good because uh, of the research collaborations I did on Cisco's side. So before that, I was pretty lucky fundraising money when I was at a university from outside. So we basically funded and built a security group with an AIC before I left to Cisco. The, in Cisco, we were funding universities and we were very lucky because about one third of the forward looking academia research worked out, which is like a really good number if you look into the forward looking stuff. And because we, we knew how to basically separate people who were just trying to sell us something they already had from the people who were genuinely interested in trying something new in collaboration with us, who were curious. The now with resistant, we are actually working with university. So we have university collaboration, which I said, or Nicola Collins said is a nonsense because we believe it works, but we actually engage with customers in that collaboration. So it's something where we, as people who know how to do research on all sides of the fence, we sit between the customer and the university, we formulate a long-term research goal that can give us competitive advantage out of what we do with the customer and then translate this into the university world where you need to have a different criteria. Because we can do this as people who know how to do both things. Okay, great. Thank you a lot, Martin, we, uh, for your presentation. And you. now we'll go to the last lightning talk. And uh, I guess this is our the biggest whale for today's. It's uh, Vladimir Kadlec, who is the head of AI in Suznam uh, to that. Ah, okay. Hi. I don't have uh, any uh, presentation, so uh, I hope you can hear me fine. Um, and uh, so first of all, I, I would like to introduce the Cisnam briefly, uh, because, well, if you are from Czech Republic, you know Cisnam. If you are not, uh, you can imagine us as uh, yahoo.com, for example. Our main service is a uh, web portal, very, very popular web page uh, in the Czech Republic. We have many services uh, here. I'm pretty sure that all of you uh, use at least one hour service uh, today. <laughs> uh, so, so, so we are quite, uh, quite a big company, 15, 1500 people. And I work in a, a full text uh, search department. Uh, we have a full text uh, search as one of our service. And uh, uh, so I'm not a head of uh, research in the whole system, but just in this uh, Full text department. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, 15 researchers uh, uh, in, a, uh, in my team, uh, all of uh, great people with PhDs or without. Uh, well, I <laughs> maybe I should uh, just a quick quick reactions to my to the to the previous speakers. I, I really love love these uh, talks. Uh, uh, 
um, I couldn't agree more with the PhD because uh, uh, I had to uh, move the drawer with my PhD thesis last week and uh, I, I didn't see the thesis for, uh, I don't know, 12 years or so. So <laughs> I, I do agree with that. I just move it uh, to the drawer and I've never seen it again. On the other hand, uh, during my PhD studies, I, I have learned a lot uh, in terms of co cooperation and stuff like that. So I wouldn't say it's useless or waste of time, but it uh, has to make the fun for you. So, and uh, for Peter uh, and Thomas presentations, uh, just a remark of uh, quality of code and <laughs> well uh, i agree that in uh, industry uh, the, the quality of code is important because uh, of all, all all of the aspects you mentioned on the other hand uh, in a well we have uh, many times we have to try many different approaches and it would uh, slow us down to for example, to make uh, code reviews for every prototype. So we, we do code reviews between uh, uh, team, team members are doing code reviews between each other. Uh, but we don't do it uh, uh, during, let's say, prototyping phase because it would slow us down. And it's not necessary because this code is, uh, it, it it's used only once, it doesn't work or it, it's not so robust, so we throw it away and that's it. Okay, uh, so uh, I uh, am going to share with you some, uh, let's say, my experience uh, with the cooperation between industry and academia. Uh, this is only my opinions, uh, not uh, official SESNAM's opinions, just for the record. Uh, uh, and uh, these are, I, I'm, I'm here at Sesnam for almost 10 years, so we did quite a lot of cooperation between the industry and academia. I think that the main, uh, uh, main point is that uh, industry uh, have the data, companies have the data, and the universities have people uh, and time to experiment with the data. Uh, so, um, as uh, as Peter said, it's uh, in industry. It's not necessary to build a state-of-the-art algorithm unless uh, uh, is unless it's more practical to implement it or or, or have. A, a, uh, more advantages just the new improve uh, I don't know accuracy by fraction of percent on the other hand uh, we have uh, well our, our income in system it's in, it's uh, in uh, uh, I don't know 4.5 billion check grants and uh, if we improve uh, our uh, targeting of uh, adverts uh, of uh, advertisements by fraction percent it's actually uh, millions of crowns so uh, uh, it uh, it has to have a practical impact i would say uh, usually we don't implement uh, state of the art algorithms because uh, they are too difficult to implement but we choose second one with i don't know less memory footprint uh, more effective cpu usage or stuff like that um, so uh, as i said uh, uh, in a um, especially uh, in uh, in in a my experience is that we have we have a lot of data uh, but uh, we don't have time to do much experiments with that so we try to provide this data to universities we try to share it where, where is possible but sometimes it's it's difficult because uh, for example we have uh, data from web search we have uh, user queries we have uh, clicks uh, to web pages and you know sometimes there are queries you don't 
to share with someone else, like uh, adult entertainment queries or something similar. Uh, so uh, we we provide data for researchers, but uh, we try to remove any sensitive information from the data uh, to uh, to support the, uh, the the research in in that way. Mm. During uh, my career in Cessna, we tried to uh, coordinate uh, with universities uh, or cooperate uh, in several uh, grant projects or uh, even EU EU funding EU funded uh, projects. Uh, but uh, well, uh, for us it's it's difficult because it's a lot of uh, paperwork. And uh, usually we don't want any money as a company. Uh, it's uh, just uh, we act as a, a so-called business partner or application guarant in these projects. But it's still a lot of paperwork in our our, our side uh, because our lawyers have uh, have to read all the contracts and it's it's usually uh, these these contracts are usually pretty long and. Uh, uh, well, yeah, uh, difficult. So, uh, well, at, I think we have now just one running, uh, 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 just one running cooperation uh, on a Czech uh, grammar corrector, and it was it was tens of hours, ten of tens of hours of our lawyers to. To proceed this, and I had to uh, <laughs> uh, present it to our uh, top management. Why we do uh, <laughs> that? Because we don't have any, we don't make any profit of it. But well, fortunately, we do that, and uh, I'm 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 happy that we do that. Uh, so. Uh, 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 so we, we try to support uh, the research in that way. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, we uh, in uh, well last I don't know five years we try to support the research group also directly with uh, some let's say direct money. But it's difficult because uh, uh, you have some research group at the university. So the research group is its own faculty and the faculty is university. So university wants some percent from this uh, amount of money. Faculty wants some amount uh, for some uh, some percent of this. So the, uh, my experiment, my experience is that the research group uh, receives only less than half, half less less than fifty percent. And this was for me, this was unacceptable. So we tried to find a different way, but uh, mm, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's not that easy. So mm, at this moment, uh, as far as I know, we support only uh, e club at the Czech Technical University, which my uh, like which previous speakers know this this uh, institution very well. <laughs> also, my, our host knows it. So. Uh, so we support eClub, and I well, it, that's great uh, because uh, I I see the, uh, the the results these guys have, and so I I, I support that, uh, and I I'm able to uh, to to present it to our management that it's it, it makes sense to support uh, eClub. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, other. Uh, EU projects or, or grants are, as I said, for us, it's uh, it makes not so much sense. Uh, we also part participated with a uh, uh, university in, uh, uh, in in Ireland in in Cork. Uh, it was nice because uh, they did uh, most of the hard paperwork for us, uh, but unfortunately, we were not su successful. But it was uh, uh, it was not very nice cooperation. It, we were part of some bigger uh, consortium with Fujitsu, and um, so uh, so when uh, 
when do uh, when uh, the university do uh, the, the hard work for us then it's it's uh, it's good but uh, uh, at the moment uh, uh, we usually don't uh, don't do uh, that much in in this in these projects uh, um so uh, for uh, uh, for uh, uh, different corporations like uh, internships or or lectures at the universities i think this is very useful for so called uh, hr marketing because uh, it makes you attract uh, uh, as an attractive employer for the students. Uh, in my point of view, uh, for example, uh, internship projects, or if you, if you, as a company, if you have, uh, if you open a diploma uh, projects or uh, just the projects or master thesis projects, uh, it uh, it makes you an attractive employer, but. Uh, from uh, my perspective, it's uh, uh, the, the, the results are not uh, uh, usually uh, directly apl applicable. So um, in Cessna, we have uh, in other departments we we have uh, uh, some uh, we have some corporations in. Uh, in uh, master thesis projects and uh, maybe also PhD projects, but uh, uh, it's uh, in a in a way as I described it that we that we provide the data, we uh, we are very supportive uh, to the students to work in this data and uh, but. Uh, uh, I I have not no project in mind that we could use the results. Uh, the, well, there are several re reasons for that. Uh, for example, well, if you have clean, clean data, if we have a clean uh, description of the project, uh, then we can do it ourselves. But uh, usually, uh, this is not the case. So, uh, so that's uh, uh, that's the problem with the with the. Uh, cooperation you know on a diploma thesis and also it it's a time consuming because you have to mentor the students and we are not so big company uh, to have a special position uh, just to get, take care of of, of these uh, of these students well it's uh, well I, I would love to i would love to do that i would love to have some uh, cooperation but uh, well we are Money oriented, I would say, was uh, every company should. <laughs> On the other hand, we are not startups, so uh, we we have some, at least some uh, opportunity to to cooperate, even if it uh, if it uh, doesn't bring direct money, let's say. So uh, uh, to conclude, uh, I would say uh, university partnerships. Are make uh, make sense definitely if you are a small company because uh, uh, it makes you uh, it, it's uh, it's good for your HR marketing. Uh, well, for Sesnam, well, Czech students know us. Uh, so, uh, for example, we are usually we are not a part of uh, so-called uh, industry partners at the university because it, it doesn't make much sense for us, but uh, for smaller companies, definitely. And uh, I'm, I'm very supportive of, for this because I'm uh, still have a feeling that universities uh, have not uh, enough money for, for research. Uh, uh, we as a company try to open the data as much as possible, or at least for some, if you sign, NDA for us, we can give you the data for your research. And uh, we are working a lot with the uh, language data. And the Czech language is, uh, well, Czech Republic is a small country. 
the Czech language is small, so not we have not so much content for huge uh, uh, deep uh, models. So it's necessary for us to cooperate. Uh, all of us, I mean, all all Czech people, uh, Czech speaking people, because uh, we don't produce so much content to to build a, a huge models like uh, for for English. So this is, I think, for us, this is necessary. Okay, that's all for me. Uh, Ellie said that we are a Prague company. Well, we have uh, offices in Prague, Brno, uh, Pilsen, Ostrava, Czechske, Budějovice, Zlín. So we are all around the country. And I'm looking for researchers. So if you are interested, uh, drop me a message. And that's it. Thanks for thank you a lot. Uh, yeah, thank you a lot, uh, Vladimir. I'm sorry. Yeah, for sure, it's Czech company. Uh, and we have a couple of questions. So um, that's actually a question which also concerns me. A lot of co companies are afraid to share the data since it's privacy concern. How to how it's difficult to anonymize data to be safe? Okay, it's difficult. Uh, it depends on the data. Uh, I would say it depends on the data. Uh, we are very, uh, I would say, we are very careful because uh, we are a big company and we are under under the radar on uh, on this uh, 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 state institutions. So we are very careful with that. Uh, I think that for most of the problems, it's not that hard. To anonymize the data, the problem is when you then the, the interpretations of the results. If you have anonymized data, just numbers instead of uh, URLs or just numbers instead of uh, text queries, then it's uh, difficult to say. Well, does it actually something useful, or we just improve the accuracy by one percent? So it depends. It depends. Uh, but we can do it. It's it's not that difficult. I would say. Okay, so the next question is, if the new Suzanne uh, via Google <laughs> lawsuit is successful, will more money be spent on research? Well, I have no comment on that because, well, uh, <laughs> I think there are other motivation than, than money on, in the last lawsuit. It's not a lawsuit yet, actually, so we will see. I Well, we will see how it <laughs> goes. <laughs> Also, this question was partially answered, but uh, that the number selected as a top Czech employee for student for the past couple of years. Do you have a lot of students in internship or doing PhD? Well, as I said, we don't have uh, in in so okay so in a full text research department, which is I don't know 150 people. We don't have many internships, at least uh, just one or, or something. On the other hand, in my uh, team. I have at least three PhD. I, I have at least at, at, at least three uh, researchers doing PhD uh, together with the with the work. So uh, I wouldn't say it a lot. Uh, I think it's very difficult to write a dissertation and working together. <laughs> uh, so, but it's possible. It's possible. Uh, well, okay, that's it. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the last question is, accept the data, do you share some challenging problems that would be interested in practice? Uh, challenging in practice, uh, the challenging problems that would be of interest. Um, uh, well, well, we have many challenging problems and uh, practice. we have all, all our problems are practical because uh, you know, we are try, trying to make our web search uh, engine better. So, uh, well, uh, well, all do, okay. Do you share it with public? I mean, maybe some, okay, uh, hackathons, Kaggle competitions or something like uh, that. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, well, not this year, but last year we had, we had at least two hackathons uh with our data mm, i uh i have uh, well 
once a year I, I have some presentation about the problems we we have and uh, what what we do uh, so it's it's well I, I'm just uh, try to well it, it's it's hard to for me to try try to pick just one because well at the moment we are working on five different I, I have five different uh, teams uh, working on five different problems and uh, so every uh, everything you can imagine uh, with related to web search we we do okay so for example for example uh, query corrections when you have a typo in a query uh, and then we have to correct it and so that's a very well known problem and a very practical problem and it's still well, we, we are able to solve it on some level but Oh, it's there's some space to improve it. There is always space to improve. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Vladimir, for your uh, talk, and thank you all for your presence here. And we are um, finishing for today, but first we have still a couple of, let's say, ten to fifteen minutes to go to the networking session, and it's Elmaloot is at networking. So if you go there, you will be in Gezer Town and uh, where we can talk and we can discuss either future employment. So maybe somebody is looking for a job and uh, Suznam and Resistant AI already have some open positions. So you can ask them more or just share the comments um, about this uh, meetup. So thank you a lot for this two days. Uh, thank you that you joined us. And we are excited and probably something like that will happen next year, but maybe it can be, it would be uh, more, um, it, would, it would contain more talks and more practical um, approaches. So thank you a lot and let's meet at the networking session.